ago. A special hello goes out to the director media for the Boston Bruins alumni, Mr. Mark Boyer. Nice to see you, Marky. Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the home of behind-the-scenes interviews, stories, and memories that celebrate the heritage of the great game of hockey. The Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast is hosted by Mark Willand. Winnipeg-based author and journalist Jeff Kerbison is our guest on episode 34 of the PHA podcast, and we'll take an in-depth look at the 78-79 Winnipeg Jets Avco Cup championship team. After the interview with Jeff, we've included some great insight on that team by Jets center Terry Ruskowski, who is our guest on episode 16. Jeff Kerbison is a lifelong Jets fan who wrote a fabulous book about the WHA's greatest line, the hotline, which featured Anders Hedberg, Ulf Nilsson, and Bobby Hull. Now, when Ulf and Anders left the Jets for the NHL New York Rangers in 1978, all seemed lost for the Jets. However, the arch-rival Houston Arrows folded in the summer of 78, and the Jets were able to retain many of their top players, including Roskowski, Rich Preston, Morris Lukowicz, and Scott Campbell. How this team overcame their differences to eventually become WHA champions is truly a remarkable story. To celebrate the 40th anniversary of the 78-79 Jets, Jeff has organized a reunion that fans can attend at a banquet on June 1, 2019. Please see the show notes for details or visit Jeff Kerbison on Twitter. To learn more about the WHA, visit us at WHA Hockey on Facebook. This is the WHA site on the web with 6,000 plus dedicated Rebel Leaguers sharing WHA memories every day. I would greatly appreciate your feedback and the heartfelt letters we've received from our fans around the world regarding the podcast. Please contact us via our Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast website or social media with any comments or questions. Also, we'd appreciate any ratings or reviews you may be inclined to give wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, let's talk classic hockey with Jeff Kerbison. We're back on the show with author and uh, Winnipeg Jets historian, Jeff Kerbison. And we're thrilled to have him here today. Jeff, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Jeff, uh, I wanted to get right into something that's very exciting happening in Winnipeg in June. And there's a reunion of the 78-79 Avco Cup, the last Avco Cup champion, uh, Winnipeg Jets. Now, these are not easy events to undertake. I've done it many times in the past. You've got to get all these guys in. You've got to get everything situated. You've got to entertain and orchestrate uh, with the fans. Uh, what was your... Because you did this before, I believe, with the uh, with the group last year. Uh, what was your motivation and your inspiration for doing this event? And let's hear a little bit about the details. Sure. Well, the inspiration came from Bob Fitchner, who I, I ran into a couple years ago. And Bob played for the 77 Nordique. And he told me one day he had just come back from their 40-year reunion in Quebec City. And I said, oh, that's great. So what would you do? Well, we had a dinner. We had a this. We had a that. I said, oh, that's great. Who's uh, who's running the, the Jets event for the 78 team? Because I, I thought that was the better team than the 77 mm -hmm. Nordique team. And he said, I have no idea. And I asked him who ran their event. And he said, well, some bellhop at the Chateau Frontenac <laughs> was taking one of the players' bags to their, to his room, and they started talking about it. And then the bellhop went back to the to his manager and said, why don't we have – we don't celebrate teams in Quebec City. We haven't had a winning team in anything for a long time. Why don't we have a reunion to celebrate these guys? And the hotel manager said, well, I'll donate the rooms. And it went from there. So I figured, well, I'd never been a bellhop, but I'd been a bartender. <laughs> so I tried to do the same thing here. So I got a bunch of sponsors for last year, and we had, we flew in uh, a bunch of players. We had 15 players, including the hotline. 
And this year, we have even more players. We have 16 players plus Coach Tom McVie, and they're all flying in at the end of May. And we're having a VIP night with sponsors on the 30th of May, and the big event is going to be a banquet uh, dinner on June 1st at the Radisson Hotel with, uh, with six, 16 players, McVie. We're going to have a Q&A with all the players. We're going to have a silent auction and a live auction. We're going to have a video uh, display of kind of, of highlights from the team from back then. And there will be lots of autographs and picture-taking and storytelling, some of which will even be true. <laughs> well, Jeff, you're a, you're a young guy. Did, uh, did you actually uh, pick up your interest of the Jets uh, post-WHA, or were you a fan during that era? I credit my parents with taking me to games as a kid. I started going the last couple of years of the hotline in particular i remember going to see the international games i remember we went to uh, a game against the czech national team where the jets came back from being down three goals in the third period and tied it and i still remember my mom waiting in line this is back in the day when you couldn't get tickets on the phone or anything my mom went down and waited in line at the box office at the winnipeg arena and got me a, a ticket with her to watch a game in the final series with um, with Winnipeg versus Edmonton, and I remember Kent Nilsson scoring a goal, mm-hmm. and that picture being in the paper the next day. Well, your mother uh, took you to some quality games, as my mom did, so God bless them. Um, you had the, the, the book last year, The Hotline, and it was the first time that somebody's really got in depth in talking about uh, those Jets era teams, particularly the 70-78 squad, which was certainly, if not the, uh, one of the top WHA teams of all time. But during that season, the overtures from the NHL, the New York Rangers and John Ferguson are happening. And it's it's understood pretty, uh, pretty early on in, in the going of that year that those two are leaving. Uh, how did that Again, I don't want to get too much in detail because you had this all covered in, in your book, but how did that all transpire, the defection of Nilsson and Hedberg from Winnipeg to the New York Rangers? Well, first of all, I would say that the 77-78 Jets team was without question the best WHA team, not one of the best, I think, because they had the signature moment, if nothing else, of being the first North American club team to beat the Soviet national team when they beat them 5-3 at the Winnipeg Arena when Hull scored three and Nilsson scored two, all against the Petrov line. Right. But the Swedes had a clause in their contract that allowed them to leave it early if they got offers from the National Hockey League. And I think they were, of the 17 teams at the time, I think they got offers from something like 14 or 15. And their agent, Don Baisley, went through them all. And it was obvious early on that uh, to anybody who knew the Jets' financial situation, that they were gone. The Jets put up a a brave front, and they said, for weeks and weeks, we are going to match. I I think if they matched the offer within something absurd, like $20,000, then the Swedes would stay. Mm -hmm. But it was the the Jets could barely make their payroll as it was. They weren't going to be able to take on two gigantic salaries and be able to continue to operate. So... They continued to say, we're going to match it, but everyone knew, everyone behind the scenes knew that that was just a smokescreen to try and bluff their way into something better than what was going to happen. Maybe they could trade them, maybe something like that could happen, but in the end, they got nothing for them, and they signed with the Rangers during the season, so there was a almost like a wake, I guess, <laughs> at the same time as they're celebrating with this great team. Uh, because everyone knew that they were going to be leaving, and they got reams of fan mail saying goodbye during their last couple of months here in Winnipeg. And I think it says a lot for them, too, because their attitude was so positive. And when you see the uh, the highlights, you see the interviews from that time, that they were still, even though they didn't necessarily have to be, they were committed to the Winnipeg Jets right to the end and mm-hmm. obviously uh, toyed with uh, the local New England Whalers in, in the finals and an absolute uh, total destruction in the in the finals. But mm-hmm. that season ends and 
it, too, it's interesting you talk about the Jets' financial situation. It's such a great franchise, five trips to the finals and three cups in seven years, but their financial situation was often precarious. When that season ends, you not only lose Hedberg and Nilsson, you lose Daniel LeBratton, Gary Bromley. Early next year, you're going to lose uh, Hull and Teddy Green, and the team is pretty much decimated at that point. You're not left with a ton of offensive power except for uh, Nilsson and uh, Lindstrom and Peter Sullivan, and it really looks bleak. Uh, Bobby Hull had gone out and tried to... uh, on behalf of the Jets to sign guys like junior players like Brian Propp, um, uh, Brad McCrimmon, Jordy Douglas, and came up empty, but only in the WHA, I guess. And you essentially assemble a team from, 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 from the ashes like that, and the arrows uh, fold, and then uh, key players, Lukowicz, Roskowski, Preston, Scott Campbell come over, some grinding players, uh, Steve West, John Gray, Paul Terbenchy. Talk a little bit about uh, that scenario. And I had Terry Ruskowski on the show a while back, and we just talked about the how unique that is. You took this whole culture of the Houston Arrows, which is a different style team and a different, different mentality, and then all of a sudden here they show up in Winnipeg, and you've got to, you've got to mix those two together. Well, it looked like it was going to be a disaster. And I know from talking to Michael Gabadi and Barry Shankro that they weren't sure what to do. And then they got a phone call from Howard Baldwin saying, the arrows are folding, get on a plane and get down there and buy that team or buy the players. And so they went down, they ended up getting the contracts for a dozen players and they traded off at four or five. And they came back and they had, uh, you know, half, essentially half of what they're going to have for their 78, 79 team. But you have to remember that the Arrows and the Jets hated each other. And they battled each other for years, and so the it was it was oil and water. When, and plus, the Arrows players, in particular Preston and Roskowski and Campbell, they didn't want to come here, and they spent the entire summer asking their agents to try and find a clause that could void their contracts so they could go somewhere else. So you can imagine with that kind of... Uh, that hanging over them when they come to Winnipeg and they have to go. They don't want to be there. The Jets don't want to see these guys there. And so for the first half of the season, they played like two separate teams. So the Arrows guys would play well with each other and they wouldn't, you know, it's like they didn't want to play well with the Jets. Mm -hmm. And when they would lose, the Arrows guys would blame the old Jets guys and the old Jets guys would blame the Arrows guys. And so it wasn't working. It, It didn't really come together. I like guess a couple different things happened then. One was that uh, the Jets fired Larry Hillman and brought in Tom McVie, who was a good an old buddy of, of John Ferguson's, and Roskowski and Lars Eric Schoberg met to kind of try and figure out some kind of detente that uh, c- could prove beneficial to everybody. So when those two guys, who were both leaders on their respective teams and on the Jets, came together, then everybody else came in behind them. And finally, for the last third of the season or so, they started to play like the team that they uh, that they could have been all year long. Right. You know, when you mentioned that, it's I see similarities, a uh, different scenario, but when 74, 75, when the Swedes and Finns came over for a total of six and then they had to integrate with the existing Jets team, there was some resentment at that time as well from the, the longtime Jet players. And, of course, they assimilated in a uh, somewhat, sim- somewhat similar situation uh, four years later. That year, as you said, the the Jets were were up and down uh, up until the end of the season. One guy who kind of gets uh, you you forget how talented he was or how good he was was a guy Scott Campbell who had health issues that, that short circuited his career, and of course he's mm-hmm. uh, you know remains a, a fixture in those days. A good young, or in any time, a good young, uh, good size two-way defenseman, a guy who can move the puck and play a tough game as well, where we're hard to find. And he was a heck of an addition, especially because I think, again, people forget that Lars Eric Schuberg essentially missed the entire season uh, with an Achilles yep. injury. Uh, talk a little bit about Scott Campbell's contribution to that great group. Well, you remember Ferguson, of course, came over from having been with the Rangers, but before that he was a longtime Montreal Canadian player. 
And so he was he knew all about the big three of Sarah Savard and Gila Point and Larry Robinson. And his philosophy was you build your team around stud defensemen. And he thought that Scott Campbell was going to be that stud defenseman for him. And all indications pointed that he would be. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a top, a top draft pick. He had a great shot. He, uh, he was a big guy. He hit guys. Bit of a mean streak. He could be dirty at times when he had to be. And unfortunately for the Jets, I mean, and obviously they saw something in him because they protected him in the, in the, uh, in the merger draft. And unfortunately he got derailed by, uh, by some health issues and some sinus and, and uh, asthma issues. Or who knows where he what he could have been, but he was definitely uh, a, a super good addition to that team. And most of the attention goes to Ruskowski and Preston and Lukwich up front because they're the ones scoring all the goals. Mm-hmm. But somebody had to had to mind the shop at the back, especially with Shu gone. I think he only played nine games that year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think Campbell's contribution uh, does get overlooked sometimes. Boy, what a year by Morris Lukwich as well. A, a career year, just absolutely. Caught everybody by surprise. I mean, he's always he was a good 35, 40 goal guy, and all of a sudden, I think he ended up with what, 65 that year. 65, that's and, right. And uh, I know you, you know, uh, you know, Luke. What, what? Talk a little bit about that season. How he just <laughs> he took off and ended up, you know, getting himself in a position where he was a protected player among many who could have been chosen. Well, I think he came over as a guy who people looked at to be a, uh, somebody who was going to help the team, but he had scored uh, 27 and 40 goals the two previous years, but I don't think anybody saw him almost matching those two years in one year. And he went from being a uh, valuable second-line guy to being a superstar on that team. And 65 goals, holy smokes. I mean, there, I don't I don't have the list in front of me of, of uh, the goals scoring leaders that year, but he's certainly at the top of it. And uh, that was a team where you had players like Kent Nilsson and Roskowski and Preston and Campbell. So there was uh, a lot of, there were a number of players who could have been the protected players to go into the, into the NHL. And I don't think he would have been at the top of the list before the season. And, but he definitely played himself into that, uh, into that twosome uh, by the end of the season. Absolutely. And he continued, of course, and he continued, of course, playing uh, super well and scoring uh, for the next uh, you know, five or six years in the, uh, in the NHL. Yeah, absolutely. Not the biggest guy, but as you said, he adapted the NHL game as well and was tough as nails. And another player, obviously, uh, you know, again, to underscore – the importance Luke Rich and, and Campbell had in being protected, you have to say goodbye to the magic man, Kent Nilsson, obviously a, uh, as I think Wayne Gretzky referred to as most talented player uh, that he had played with in that era. And certainly mm-hmm. uh, Rich Preston, who I think everybody knew was gone to Chicago, and then, of course, Terry Ruskowski. Tough to say goodbye to those guys. But what's interesting about all of this is when you re- replay the 78-79 playoffs, it's a now everybody knows officially that the WHA is no more, and mm-hmm. for example, Quebec and Cincinnati start the, the playoffs uh, with a threat of a boycott because of the uh, the, the, the payments discrepancies. They wanted ten thousand, they end up getting paid seven thousand, whatever. The league was kind of mm-hmm. sputtering to an end, and you know I think Jacques Demers was very clear that you know he wasn't getting much of an effort out of his guys who, who got wiped out by, by Winnipeg early in the playoffs. But I think it mm-hmm. does say a lot about the character of that team, that Winnipeg Jets team and the coach and how they had come together. They stayed focused even though they knew that this, this was it for the league. And they were able to go out on a, on a, a uh, stay focused and work their tails off and, uh, and beat some good teams to, to win it all. Mm-hmm, sure. I should say, too, that I just pulled it up, and Real Cluche had the most goals that year. Uh, it was 75 for the Nordique, right. which is which is crazy. And, and, um, and Lukic was second with 65. But that team was not favored, even though they went into the playoffs uh, on a bit of a high, they were not favored to beat Quebec in, the, uh, in their first round, and they were certainly not favored to beat the Oilers in the, in the final. And a lot of that, I think, the credit has to go to uh, a couple. Well, first of all, 
if you talk to Rich Preston, who was the MVP of those playoffs, he'll say there shouldn't be an MVP of a team sport like that because everybody played huge roles. Mm-hmm. But you can certainly look, you can certainly look to Preston, who uh, who was great. Uh, Gary Smith, people call him Suitcase. He prefers Axe. Right. But he obviously came in and played unbelievably for his last few games of the season when he came in from, from after being sitting around in his home in his home for a couple of months doing nothing after Indianapolis folded. Mm-hmm. And then he was but he was a star in the playoffs. And Terry Roskowski missed game five with a shoulder injury. Right. And and he uh, he had been uh, great up to then. And I know that um I talked to Tom McVie about this, and he said that Chuck Babcock, the Jets trainer, stayed up all night the night before that sixth game with Ruskowski working on his shoulder. And uh, and then he, he was ready to play that night. No one thought he was going to be able to. He didn't take the warm-up, so the Oilers didn't know he was going to be there, And the, but he was in the starting lineup. And I think he had four points by the start of the third period, at which point McVie said to him, sit down, you've done enough. And uh, he got to sit there for the last and enjoy the last few minutes and not have to worry about going out there and having his shoulder fall off. So when you see a guy like that uh, with that kind of commitment and that kind of sacrifice, it's no, it's no surprise, actually, that he was the first and I believe only player in professional hockey history to be the captain of four different teams. Exactly, you're right. I, mean, what, uh, I had so much respect for him he was almost he reminded me kind of like a, the WHA's Bobby Clark and yeah. and he was just uh, and I really enjoyed talking to him on, on our, our uh, on our show earlier this year I wanted someone I always wanted to talk about you in players who played with him had so much respect for him just for some of the things that you, you just talked about now one more player on that team I want to ask you about of course we go through all 20 we won't is that what I the guy I call the baby face assassin Kim Claxon um, who somehow mm-hmm. ended up Without a mark on his face after his career was over, he uh, he always looked about ten years younger than his age. And in the seventy seven seventy eight, he had to handle, especially with Birmingham in the mix, he had to handle a lot of the of, of the of the fighting, the fisticuffs, which were plentiful that year. Uh, the next mm-hmm. year comes, you, you've got some help with Terry Roskowski, and so you had a little bit of help there, but. Uh, Talk a little bit about uh, Kim Claxton and his contributions to the Winnipeg Jets. Well, I think nothing says it better than, or nobody says it better than Kent Nelson, who said that Claxton was the MVP of his team because he let the skilled players have the room to do what they needed to do. And if somebody was going to take liberties with one of them, they had to answer to Claxton. And there's a great clip on YouTube, I don't know if you've seen it, when Claxton announced him, his arrival in the WHA, and it's, uh, it's, it's a clip with, that just shows a 45, like a record, right. coming down, right. needle going on it. Bob Lane. And it's, uh, right, and it's, so it's the play-by-play of this game, and uh, it's, uh, it's the, one of the greatest clips I've ever seen, where it's Claxton and Fatou, and the, 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 the radio coverage of that fight is fantastic and <laughs> it is. and and Fatiu Fatiu was uh, was uh, a well-known enforcer and Claxon filled him in well yeah so no, I, heard, he was, uh, I heard that uh, interestingly I remember the game and I heard it from the other end I heard Bob Newmeyer uh the WTIC radio in in Hartford broadcasting that as well and Kim Claxon came on that that racers team was it, it was an expansion team the year before they were Basically dead as a doornail the, the next season. They're really struggling and uh, brought in uh, Jacques Demers. And then uh, when Kim Claxa came up, and what I always remember about him, Jeff, uh, is we, we, coming into Hartford. I always remember him coming off the pregame warm up and just flying out of the pregame warm up all the way to 200 feet to the other team's end and, <laughs> and it just basically just setting a tone. And um, he just had this this streak about him. There's, there's something about him. He was just fearless. He mixed it up with anybody and everybody. He made a statement right away and was able to uh, mm-hmm. make a nice career for himself. If you meet him, he is 5'9". But his fists are the size of canned hams. 
Right. And so when you shake your ha- when you shake hands with him, your hand disappears inside his inside his hand. So you can certainly see w- with the speed he could throw them that he was going to do some damage because he just had huge mitts. Yeah, he sure did. The guy we the guy we haven't talked about is Kent Nilsson. Right, I haven't and talked about the Magic Man. Who ultimately, I guess, the guy you really want to talk about because his skill was absurd, and um, be sure they showed that in the in the NHL as well. Uh, fill us in a little bit on on Kent Nilsson and if some of the fans who maybe aren't familiar with him and his talent and his contributions to the Jets. Well, first of all, he's a tricky guy to get because he's very busy. He still scouts for the Florida Panthers, mm-hmm. and he caddies for his wife, who's a professional golfer. Oh. So we just got him to confirm a, co- a couple of weeks ago to come to Winnipeg for the reunion here. But he was he came over in 77. There was kind of some kind of side deal with Birmingham because I guess they had his rights somehow. And, and then Gilles Leger uh, thought, well, you know, if I can make some kind of side deal to make him happy, get him in the league, make the, make the league better, I'll do it. So then he came to Winnipeg to play with all the other Swedes. And so when Kent Nilsson in the 77-78 season, when he's your number two center, mm-hmm. you got a pretty good team. Right. When he's your number one center the next year, he's still it's still great. And he would do things in practice that other players didn't really understand what was going on. And if you talk to Scott Campbell, he'll tell you about things that, that um, Nilsson would do in a game where he'd be skating along the blue line on a power play. He would make some kind of fake, drop the puck into his skates, kick it back up, and people would peel off to go where they thought the puck was going to go, and he'd have an open road into the slot. He'd come in and he'd rip it home. And Tommy V would tell stories about how he, they would do drills, and everyone would be getting so frustrated because they couldn't stop him. He would have to stop the drill. Nice. And, of course, Peter Forsberg uh, gained infamy by using um, a move that Nilsson had, had I, from, all, from all indications, he, that he's the first one to do it. When you go in and you and you go around one way and bring the puck back the other side with one hand and he did it in the 1994 Olympic shoot I think it was 94 Olympic shootout right mm-hmm. they had a stat made about it and people and when people do it today when players do it today people say oh there he goes make it doing the Forsberg move <laughs> and I always sent those broadcasters tweets or emails saying listen it's not the Forsberg it's the Nilsson right and there's a shot of him and there's a shot of him in 86 or 87 in the world championships doing that Against the Americans at full speed, mm-hmm. and so it's one thing to do it in a, in a in a in a shootout. It's another thing to do it when you got three guys chasing you. So he was, he had uh, he had skill like crazy. I've, I've talked to other players who play with him in in Calgary, and they used to do a thing at the end of practice where you would have to hit the crossbar from the slot, and they'd play for lunch. And so as soon as you hit from the crossbar, if you missed, you're out. So then they would go from the from the slot back to the blue line. And so then, and so Nilsson and a bunch of people hit from the slot, and then as they kept getting further back, it's just Nilsson left. So Nilsson got it from his first shot in the, in the slot, hit the crossbar with his first shot from the blue line, his first shot from the red line, his first shot from the far blue line. Mm-hmm. Then he went to the far, then he went to the other goal line, and shot and missed by three inches. And so a couple guys were kind of tripping him about it, and then he took another shot and started skating towards them. And as he got kind of halfway out of the zone, it rang off the crossbar. <laughs> so that kind of that kind of hand-eye coordination is crazy. And one of the, I think it was Larry Hillman who told me that Nilsson had this very annoying habit of when he would get an open net, he would uh, ring the puck off the post and into the net. Mm-hmm. And so Nilsson would come back to the bench and the coach would say, are you trying to give me a heart attack? Mm-hmm. Because you've got, you've got all this net shooter and you're putting it in the tiniest spot. What are you doing? And Nilsson said, oh, I like to hear the ringing of the puck <laughs> off the post. That's funny. He um, but yes. now, when you one of the great what ifs of this team is, of course, as a result of the amalgamation of the Jets into the National Hockey League, they could could reply or only retain the two aforementioned players plus goaltenders. So, in your opinion, looking back at it, going to that 79-80 season, of course, Barry Long was another guy they they lost. We didn't mention. So you look at that mm-hmm. team intact. How do you think they would have fared in the NHL in year one? Well, I think they would have been a top six team. And most people who you talk to, if you talk to Preston or Ruskowski or Lukwicz, they would agree with that. And the 78 team might have even would have been a little bit higher, I think. But still, I think if you take, if you've got lines with Ruskowski, Preston, Lukwicz, Sullivan, Lindstrom, Nilsson as your top two lines, mm-hmm. you're scoring a lot of goals. 
and the uh, and the, and once Schubert came back on defense, that changed everything. I mean, he was. You have to remember that even though he was near the end of his career, he was considered by all the Swedes and the Europeans as an elite defenseman in in Europe, and certainly superior to Boris Salming in every way. Mm-hmm. And to have him back there, uh, he's, he's only if you could say he had a weakness, it was he didn't have a great shot. But he was fast. He was mobile. He could. He was one of the first guys to jump up in the play. Uh, he was kind of the fourth member of the hotline. People like to call him. Mm-hmm. And he could. Uh, and no matter where you dump the puck into the zone, he was getting it and getting it out. So he was the the first pass is a crucial pass in hockey. He was a master of that. And I think if you had that team with shoe with a healthy Achilles tendon, you would have had a contending team in for sure in the NHL. Well, I would agree. And if you look at all the, if you, but if you look at the results of the WHA NHL exhibition games, the Jets had a had a very solid winning percentage against the NHL teams, and the NHL teams did not come to town and put their backup goalies in or rest their superstars. Mm-hmm. They played those guys because it was a political battle, right. also, and they wanted to beat the WHA teams, and they didn't. Right. Well, I used to anxiously go to the newspaper or to the hockey news to find those results because I was such a WHA zealot. Even you know, I grew up a Bruins fan in the Boston area, but of course uh, became a Whalers fan as, as things went on and always trying to remind people this is a heck of a league and certainly this team was instrumental in, in that belief. And the one thing about them too is they would have been going to your point of being a top six team. They were kind of a NHL ready team. They had an NHL quality coach, and they were they were physically aggressive and tough, along with the the skills. So a tremendous job by you again, once again pulling this all together, because I don't think anybody else would have done it. So it was a lot of uh, a lot of effort, and I think it's going to be a great opportunity to see a very unique group of players who did something very very special and brought to this point the last championship to Winnipeg. So kudos to you. Thanks. Can I give you the final rundown of who's coming? Absolutely. Okay, so in no particular order, we have Kent Nilsson, Terry Ruskowski, Rich Preston, Scott Campbell, Morris Lukwich, Peter Sullivan, Roland Erickson, Mark, uh, Willie Lindstrom, Marcus Matson, Joe Daly, Bill Asuk, Lyle Moffat, Glenn Hicks, Paul McKinnon, John Gray, and Kim Claxon. Plus Tom McVie. Plus Tom McVie. It's great you got John Gray. I haven't seen him in a while. Uh, is he, he's still in New Hampshire in the U.S. That's right. Yep. Yeah, he, he went on to, like a lot of these guys went on to a lot of a uh, lot of success post career as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in, for fans to find information and get tickets, etc., where should they, we send them? They can go to a, there's a website called Eventbrite, B R I T E, mm-hmm. and you can search for Winnipeg Jets 1979 reunion. You can find it also on, if you find me on Twitter, it's, on, it's at Jeff Kerbison, uh, G-E-O-F-F-K-I-R-B-Y-S-O-N. And you can also find, if you search on uh, Facebook, you can find it there too. All right. Now, we will post that in the show notes for this podcast. Also, uh, for our number of WHA fans and our very popular WHA hockey page on Facebook, we'll post it on there as well. And we're looking forward to I'm tempted to go. I'm tempted to to fly up to Winnipeg to see this because I think it's a it's it's a great event. Very rare, and as I said, a terrific effort effort on your part. But in the meantime, Jeff, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate sharing the thoughts on the Winnipeg Jets of the WHA, and uh, good luck in your event uh, later this month. What do you mean you're just tempted to come? <laughs> just, I got to explain this to my wife that uh, during Memorial Day weekend, I'm going to depart from the family to go to Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. But I think she'll understand at this point, and it's not something that uh, I want to miss. And it, once, once these events, I, when I looked at it uh, enviously last year, that, that 77, 78 group, uh, I said to myself, "Boy, I wish I were there. And if there was an opportunity to go, I'd do it. I'd, I'd do it." Well, here's the opportunity, so uh, the odds are good that I'll be there as well. Well, I tell you, it really is a time machine for people because they come there with their memories as kids. They bring pictures and jerseys and everything, and cards to be signed. And the players wear out their sharpies signing for them, smiling for pictures, telling stories, and everyone leaves. Uh, feeling like a million bucks because the players, they know you know who paid their salaries back then. They appreciate 
that they're coming out to celebrate them. And uh, the players had a great time. The, all the fans had a great time, and, the whole, and everybody left uh, wishing we were back in 1978. <laughs> well, again, Jeff, uh, kudos to you. Great job. Thanks very much for pulling this together, and we'll look forward to talking to you real soon. Okay, thanks for having thanks, me. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. On episode 16 of our podcast, we got some great insights on that 1978-79 Jets team from none other than Terry Ruskowski. But you did disperse, and in something that could only happen in the WHA, the core of your team uh, ends up going to Winnipeg, and a team that had just lost Anders Hedberg, Ulf Nilsson, Daniel Bratton, and uh, Tommy Bergman. So the team was kind of uh, in real trouble going into that last WHA season. All of a sudden, the Houston Aero players arrive. That's an interesting season. The fans up there still really love that team. And, you know, when we post things about you, uh, that team, Kim Claxton, those guys, it always gets a great response online. Um, uh, it's but, to hear. but it's it was such an interesting season. You guys come together uh, with the with the core guys from the Jets, your core guys in the Euros. You have to kind of come together. You have a coaching change. Talk a little bit about it. Plus, you lost large Eric Schubert for the whole regular season. Talk a little yeah, bit about that yeah. 78-79 Winnipeg Jets team. I, I, I think they liked us because it was so different from the teams they had before. Like, we weren't a good team when we first got there together. We We just weren't a good team. We hated Winnipeg Jets. Winnipeg hated the Arrows because right. we were always in the finals going against each other for the championship. And now all of a sudden, you know, hanging, banging guys, flat guy, fought Lyle Moffat, you know, in the penalty box. We had <laughs> things all hanging over our arms and legs and got kicked out. We just didn't like each other. And it took us a long time to actually be a team. And I think the fans in Winnipeg saw the transition from not liking each other to liking, to caring, and then, like I say, loving each other and going and having a chance to win. But it, it, we were coming together, but the last key was Tom McVeigh coming in and taking over from the coach. Even though Hillman did, I think, a real good job, and I hate when coaches get fired because it's the coach I got let go three times, right. which I don't like. But <laughs> I think he was the guy that came in there. You know, he didn't give a darn. If you were, if you're Jed, if you're, he didn't care. He, you know, you just treat everybody the same way. You're skating this, you're skating over here. Let's do it. And every drill that he that we did skating wise, he did the same thing. And it was, it was amazing. When the first camp, I think the first training, uh, not training camp, but the first practice. And I remember Scott Campbell having a broken jaw, and he was having migraine headaches. And so he, they thought it was a tooth problem. So they pulled the tooth in the front, and he was wired jaw because he had his jaw broken. And yep. man, he just skated us like he just skated us, Mark, like you would not believe. And going. <laughs> It this is like training camp all over again. This is crazy. And we're all coming off, and and um, and uh, Scott was like throwing up, trying to throw up it through the tooth, and he was just struggling. Oh. And, and uh, <laughs> he said, yeah, he's coming off, and Tom McVeigh was there by the door, and Scott goes, and I was helping him off because he, he was just dead tired, like throwing up, and he goes, is that the best you can do? <laughs> and he goes, Tom McVeigh says, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow. And I go, Scott, he shut up. Just <laughs> up. He's killing me, but he skated us, and um, yeah, we had four. We had a week or so off before we played uh, Quebec City in the finals. We won the championship, and we just walked all over them. Like they didn't have a chance. And of course, Edmonton was a little bit different case. They had a really good, strong team, and, and they were prepared uh, for us. And I think that they realized that we were fourth. Just made the playoffs in the fourth fourth position, and they were first. And they had all nice advantage and all that kind of stuff. And I think we surprised them. Uh, the team that we had was very, very talented, very talented. And we, when we put it all together, when Tom McVie came, we put it all together. We were a damn good hockey team, Mark. Like, yeah, you sure did. A good hockey team. A lot of a lot of depth. One guy I was going to ask you about who gets kind of forgotten in, in the discussions of the great defenseman of that era is Lars Eric Schuberg. Um, what are your What are your thoughts about uh, your memories about Lars Eric? I didn't know him very well because I got I played against him and he came in and he had Achilles he, Achilles heel or Achilles tendon uh, snapped and he, and he couldn't play a whole lot and maybe at the very end he did again. Just a 
just a professional, just a nice guy that was professional that treated everybody nice. And Schubert, when he got the puck, all you had to do was skate hard and get in the open and put your stick down because it was on your stick and you were going full board somewhere else. He wasn't big, but he he positioned himself so well that he always seemed to get the puck or he always separated the puck from the, from the player and make a play. He was just a solid, 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 good defenseman that did things proper, not one time, but every time. Right. And he was so easy to play for and play with. He's just, as soon as he got the puck, just go because you're getting it. Thanks for listening to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast. Be sure to visit us at ProHockeyAlumni.org.